So welcome to uh, this uh, session. I will now introduce uh, Joanne, <laughs> who has uh, been staying at uh, Dhammasara Monastery, an NBM monastery, and Bodhinyana Monastery. So uh, <laughs> she's now going to introduce me. Yes. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> I'm really blessed that he remembers my name this time. <laughs> Good morning and welcome guests to the day of mindfulness, highway to happiness. Before we start, may I please ask all of you to turn off your mobile phone or switch your mobile phone to silence mode. And what happens if the mobile phone goes off? I think they turn into some sort That's of karma. That's bad karma mm. for mobile phones. So the mobile phones they end up as as either parking meters or a speed cameras, <laughs> the lowest form of life for technology. So get that as a joke. <laughs> it's not serious. So remember to do that. I would like to give you a little bit more information about Bodhiana International Foundation. Bodhiana International Foundation is a non-profit organization. All the directors and community members are on volunteer basis. And all donation and net proceeds are to support Ajahn's project. For your further information, any fully ordained monks and nuns in Theravada tradition do not handle money. Right, Ajahn? Yes. <laughs> right on. <laughs> yep. So that's what um, BIF, Bodhiana International Foundation, is about. Let me formally introduce introduce Ajahn Brahm. Ajahn Brahm was born in London. His lifetime. Yep. And graduated, yeah, the lifetime introduction, and graduated from Cambridge University in theoretical physics. After teaching in high school for one year, he traveled to Thailand without speaking Thai, right? Uh, I can speak a couple of words. Oh, a so couple I, of words. Yeah. <laughs> but not much. Yep, and to become a Theravada Buddhist monk under the guidance of the late meditation master Ajahn Chah. I, uh, I, I had a broken heart, so I went to Thailand to become a monk <laughs> to forget. <laughs> and uh, I did, uh, it was consistent because I did forget. I don't know, I can't remember anything. It's all good. So it must be right. <laughs> <laughs> Ajahn Brahm has now been a Buddhist monk for over 43 years. Yeah. Very old monk now. <laughs> I used to be very thin and handsome, and now look what you've done to me. <laughs> <laughs> yep, give him the big belly. Yeah. So I actually named him as the Santa Claus when I visited him yeah. in December. <laughs> yeah, but I have a nickname now. It's called Ajahn Donut. Because <laughs> you know what, Donut? Because you're round, and you're sweet, and holy. And also very soft inside. Soft inside, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he is the abbot of Bodhiana Monastery in Australia and also the spiritual dictator. <laughs> yep, dictator. Spiritual director of various Buddhist associations, amongst many other roles. He is a highly sought speaker, world speaker traveling around the world to give speeches. And also he was invited to United Nations. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, Google. Yeah. Facebook. Yeah. I heard also LinkedIn, right? Uh, only this time, I think. Oh, this time. First time to LinkedIn. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> his, com his winning combination of wit and wisdom makes his books bestsellers in many languages. Yeah, big trouble. <laughs> it's true because I have to sign the books. <laughs> and was it in Indonesia, once they had thousand books to pre-sign before they gave them out. Thousand, I did them all in just under one hour. Guinness Book of Records, fastest signer in the West. <laughs> but afterwards, my arm really hurt. <laughs> so anyway, that's the trouble when you so <laughs> we tried it. We tried to actually to put the signature already in the books. You know, so it's already printed in there. What happened next? They still want the personal one. <laughs> then they want a chop. So they did a chop. No. So just they, because what they did, we chop it, you know, just with a stamp. And they go around and go to the end of the queue and start again. So they still had to do it. Did they take selfie with you? 
Now we don't do selfies because one of the things in Buddhism like uh, emptiness, no self, so we don't do selfies. <laughs> we do weefies. <laughs> That's us. So you can't do a selfie with me. Weefy, okay. So remember, remember to ask Ajahn for the weefy. <laughs> we weefy, yeah. Weefy. Because self is just so much into one's own being and personality and selfishness. So it's not really good, you know, just a self. Yeah. So it's nice for us, nice memories. So it's always called it we fee. We fee. <laughs> His popular teachings, like the ones you watch on YouTube, regularly attract thousands of people around the world. Oh, and that's why I flew all the way to Australia to visit him. Yeah. So with no further ado, let's yeah. give a warm welcome to Ajahn Brown. <laughs> So very good, thank you again for coming. I see there's many people here I recognize from last year, which means that my teachings couldn't have been very good last year. <laughs> that you have to redo the course. <laughs> but it's very wonderful to come again to the Hong Kong University Center of Misbehavioral Health. And <laughs> did I get that right? <laughs> no, it's been <laughs> Because it's wonderful to see that how we can create like health and happiness in so many different areas of our life. And of course, you only have to look, you know, at uh, news bulletins and see what happens in the hospitals. It's not just um, the physical health, but the emotional, the mental health is all part of it. And it's just the case that. Uh, with meditation, there's so many studies coming out and they continue to come out to show just how wonderful it is to be able to, to learn these mental attitudes, mental trainings which actually help with your health. And it's wonderful, I, actually the, uh, Joanne never actually mentioned uh, the warning which I've been given people that you know I, I do have, I was diagnosed recently with a contagious disease and it's very, very contagious, and it's, there's no cure for it, and it's called Happy Titus. <laughs> it's Happy Titus B. <laughs> not Hepatitis, Happy Titus. It's a nice uh, communicable disease. <laughs> but it's true, if one person is happy, many other people are happy. It does actually um, uh, pass on to people. So if we can just create you know, uh, one or two people who are happy in this world, even in your family, in your workplace, then everybody else gets happy. Just for an example, just how many people you go to work and people are always miserable. So they always have a hard time at work. Is that very productive? Is that make the work experience uh, enjoyable? How many of you Enjoy going to work in the morning. I do. <laughs> I have fun. Because you make sure that whatever you do, you put fun into it. So you don't expect your job to actually to give you the fun. You put the fun into it. All it is is a change of attitude. A different way of seeing things. A different way of seeing your body, your mind, your life. And this is one of the great things which mindfulness and meditation will give to you. Now, it was a bit strange at first, you know, when I um, decided to pursue the path of meditation. Why? And it was only a joke, you know, saying that I became a monk to forget. You know, so it wasn't that at all. I became a monk because to be happy. Because the happiest people I'd ever seen, you know, this was not, you know, with uh, doing CT scans, but just these uh, Buddhist monks, people who didn't have anything. Th how come these people can be so happy? I don't know, maybe it's because, like, I gave a talk on, uh, in Bangkok a few days ago, a couple of weeks ago, sorry, on anti-aging. And they were wondering, sort of, uh, Ajahn Brahm, you know, I, I'm, I'm 66 now, 67th year now, and I said, Ajahn Brahm, you don't look 66. I said, what's the secret of, of, of looking young? 
And straight away I said, not getting married. That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. But everyone laughed at that, so there must be some truth in it. <laughs> no, no, it's not that. It's about learning how to, to take life easy, and even if you have to work hard, you can still take life easy. So this is not about lessening your workload. It's not about, you know, just trying to just live apart from other people in a forest somewhere and just let the world just go. No, it's whether you're with other people, whether you're with yourself, the right attitude, the awareness gives you the learning, gives you the wisdom to be happy wherever you are. Now I'm going to just say something first of all because the, uh, this particular set of talks is called The Highway to Happiness and you can see the little book which we're giving out there, The uh, Happy Every Day. And straight away many people say, hang on a minute, how can you be happy every day? And that can't work. And anyway, so what about night time? Okay, happy every day and happy every night time as well. But how can you do that? And the answer is in uh, one of the other books which I wrote, and the American version is called Don't Worry, Be Grumpy. And this was an important little concept and how to be happy and how to use mindfulness to be happy is because a lot of times people are just so sick of trying to be happy. As if, if you don't get happy, then there's something terribly wrong with you. And people try so hard to be happy that again it makes them so frustrated. And the key story, because I like telling anecdotes to make this quite clear, the key story was on one of these retreats which I was holding some years ago. And it's just like you know, the, the day of happiness or the day of mindfulness today. That on this one, uh, it, was a, it was about seven or eight day, nine day uh, a residential retreat, this lady came up to me and she said, I can't take it anymore. It's after about three or four days. I think I have to leave and go home. I said, why? What's the problem? Yeah, I feel miserable. I feel really grumpy. I don't feel well. And I see all these other people smiling. And you smile at me and you say, oh, just be happy. Be happy every day. And it really just made me so sick. <laughs> I'm fed up with trying to be happy. I feel such a failure that I'm not happy. And so, as a result of that, seeing what the problem was, I went into the office and I got out the computer and I just opened up uh, the computer and I wrote on, on, I used Gothic script, just like you have when you get your degrees from university, if you get a degree from university or marriage certificates or driving license, it was like the very first grumpy license. So I wrote it as carefully as I possibly could, saying this license officially gives the owner permission to be miserable for any reason, <laughs> or no reason whatsoever, with no expiry date for the rest of your life, signed Ajahn Brahm. And of course, as soon as she got permission to be miserable, she was happy and smiling for the rest of the retreat. <laughs> Now, do you understand what it is? People try so hard to be healthy, so hard to be happy, so hard to be successful that it makes you sick. So instead of that, I'm mindful to say, oh, just let it be. If you feel miserable, just be miserable. It's not against the law. Is it against the law in Hong Kong? You're not allowed to be miserable? <laughs> <laughs> Is it against the law? You're not allowed to be sick. So sometimes we stigmatize things. And it's a stigmatizing of mental health, the stigmatizing of um, differences, stigmatizing of even physical health. That is one of the biggest problems. 
So, when it's the center of behavioral health, that's why when I said the center of misbehavioral health, there was something very deep in that. Why do you always have to behave? <laughs> the more stress on you. Even just coming in here, the gentleman, he was saying, because I went to the, the restroom, I called it letting go room, before I came in here. And then oh, he said, oh, I'm glad to see you, that you know, I was afraid of being late. There's nothing wrong with being late. How many times do you stress out because you try so hard to get there on time? It doesn't matter. I'll always give the same talks next year, <laughs> same jokes. <laughs> you can relax. So people get killing themselves, you know, trying to be on time, trying to live up to other, other people's expectations, trying to fit in. And so the first real big story about behavioral health and mindfulness is practical story of uh, going for the walk in the forest. I say this every year, I say this many, many times because it is a powerful story. I don't mind repeating those stories which really make a difference. And that is that if ever you feel that there's something wrong with you, that you don't fit in, or that somehow or other that just, you know, other people are having a good time and you're not, they're being successful and you're not, then go for a walk in a forest, natural forest, not botanical gardens or anything, which is fake, but a natural forest. And there, look for, number one, the perfect tree. The tree which is dead straight, with all the branches equally spaced, with all the leaves green, and none of them which have been eaten by any bugs. See the tree with a smooth trunk, with no damage on the bark. If you can find one of those trees, I've been in many forests, I've never seen a tree like that, ever. Every natural tree I have seen is always bent, crooked and damaged. Yellow leaves, brown leaves, green leaves, munched by bugs, and little holes where our big branches have been torn off by the storms of life. And in those little holes, that's where the little animals live. Over in Australia, the little possums. Very cute little beings. Now those possums over there, when they have a baby, the baby goes on the mummy's back. And because it's, you know, Australia didn't have many uh, predators, but especially in monasteries, they just, you know, come around at night time, around the monks' hearts, you can pat them. And these mothers, they're not even afraid of the monks patting their little babies on the back. It's just so incredibly cute. But anyway, that's because they have no predators. They feel quite safe. And that's actually, that's where they, they live, in the holes which are, are made when a branch falls off a tree. And you don't find a perfect tree, if that's your idea of perfection, anywhere in this world, in a real forest. When you understand that, you go to the next level and find not a perfect tree, the most beautiful tree. And you'll find your favorite tree, the one which you delight in most of all, which you always want to go back to, are the trees which are the most bent and crooked, which are all twisted all over the place. There is lovely damages on the bark. Those are the most beautiful trees in the forest. The crooked and bent and twisted ones. The ones which have been damaged by the storms of life. So, if you are damaged goods, <laughs> like I am, like we all are, we've gone through the storms of life, bits broken off here, bits broken off there, then, number one, you belong. That's the most important thing, you belong. There's nothing wrong with you. You're part of nature. You're one of the other trees in the beautiful big forest of humankind. And number two, not only do you belong, but sometimes the more damaged, the more beautiful and attractive you become. The more character, the more you have to offer to other people. You don't have to be perfect. In fact, being perfect sucks. It's, it's terrible trying to be perfect. 
And of course, a lot of times, it does make you sick, trying so hard to be perfect. Like trying to be happy is what makes people sick. So don't try to be happy, just be yourself, whatever it happens to be. And that means that you get happy less, just like that person who, as soon as I said, okay, you can't be grumpy, as soon as I said that, she was really happy. And she also got a very important message in life. And th this, these stories which, you know, you hear here, it's amazing just how far, you know, they go in life. Because many of them actually get plagiarized that somebody, when I was, that's right, it was uh, a uh, top doctor over in Bangkok, and he was, say, he got this book, a self-help book, called uh, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a FCK. He missed out one of those words there. And of course, I never looked at that book, it had a very naughty title. But he said, this is your teachings, Ajahn Brahm, about <laughs> just plagiarizing me again. Just about sort of letting go, accepting things, and not struggling too hard to be something which you're not. So this is actually where the mindfulness, the mindfulness which doesn't judge, which doesn't say that I'm not going to see the truth because I don't like seeing the truth, truth, which actually sees things, how your body is, how it works, how relationships work, you know, how you can actually, so many people these days, it's amazing that I've been celibate for the last 43 years and still people ask me questions about relationships. And I give really good answers because <laughs> they keep coming back again to answer more. Because all about life, you're always trying to impress somebody in your life. And that just after a while, you know, you just, it's impossible. You try to live up to other people's in, uh, expectations. That doesn't work. You know, this, this spirituality, mindfulness, is so popular these days that, you know, you do get many sort of celebrities actually come on retreats. And even um, there was uh, that supermodel, Kate Moss. You know, she meditates. And one of my friends was on a retreat when Kate Moss was on the retreat. Now, you know, guys being guys, you know, he was thinking, which, who is she? And so instead of watching, uh, watching his breath, he was looking at which one was Kate Moss, <laughs> supermodel. And he told me, it was amazing, he couldn't notice who she was. She looked and looked and looked and looked, but didn't notice. She was one of the people on retreat. And the reason was, was because the art of a supermodel, supermodels aren't real. They're just like these blank canvases which, you know, the makeup artist, the lighting, the photographer, the airbrushing can make something like a fantasy person. But in real life, even the supermodels have got pimples. <laughs> and they've got bad teeth or whatever it is. You can brush them off. And this is one of the great things to be able to notice. You don't have to try hard to be something you're not. That's what really makes you sick. So, where all this wisdom comes from is like, not from books, except this, that, that Happiness from Meditation, that's a good book. Because <laughs> they try to get rid of these things. So, but where it actually comes from is just like nice being aware of what's happening inside of you through the mindfulness, the awareness of how your own body and mind works. Now, to encourage you to be able to you know, learn a bit of meditation and how it works, I don't think I told this story last uh, time, but it's a great story because it concerns one of the monks who I've been living with for a long time now. And he uh, always had trouble uh, keeping a straight back when he was meditating. Even actually sitting on the floor was just so painful for him. had had back pains. So of course you go to the GP. GP refers you to a specialist. Specialist does a CT scan. And then that's when they found out he had a congenital defect of his spine. And at that time it was you know, inoperable, you know, because it's so close to you know, really important parts of your body, it could, it could uh, uh, end up being uh, paraplegic afterwards. So they just told him, you just have to endure it and m maybe try not to meditate so much. And that's trying to tell like a, a cook not to eat, which is impossible. So in the end, sort of he, had this dilemma, what should I do? The meditation is my life, what I love doing. 
but it's so painful. And this is the exercise which he learned, which gives you an idea of how mindfulness can help with the problems of life, even with medical problems. So they told him, uh, it was actually, he saw this in a book, but he adapted it. On either side of your spine, there are muscles which you don't even know exist. You're not aware of them at all because you don't need to be. And much of the body works, you know, on autopilot. And because you don't need to, most people, they never developed awareness of those muscles. So I had a mindfulness exercise, which he had to repeat for about three months. Every day he took his hand and he stroked the muscles behind his back, uh, where they were instructed to be, stroked them and stroked them and stroked them, until the time came when he could feel those muscles without even touching them. In neuroscience, it was just creating those uh, neural connections between that muscle and your brain, so they were now aware of those muscles. So the first thing was getting awareness you know, of these muscles. Most of the time you don't need to. You can't be aware of everything, otherwise you go crazy. There's too much stuff in your brain. So just that was important for him, so he stroked them and stroked them and stroked them until he could be aware of them. Once he was aware of them, you could actually feel them, just like you, know, you can feel you know, your tummy, or you can feel your, your arms, or whatever. You've got awareness of many parts of your body, but not everywhere. So he developed awareness of these muscles. And the next thing, it took him a while to do this, trial and error, to see if he could move those muscles. Stretch them, relax them, stretch them, relax, relax them. It took him a while to do that, you know, try this, try that. The important part of the mindfulness, the awareness, was it gave him the feedback. You could actually s feel, okay, yeah, they stretched, it's worked. F try and find out how they, they relax. You get the, the feedback. And that is how he learned, that's how learning happens. We have an instruction, and we get some feedback afterwards, whether we got it or we didn't get it. And so after a while, he learned how to move those muscles. And of course, once he could move them, just at will, just like I can move my arm up and down when I want to, now he could move those muscles whenever he wanted to. He'd have an exercise routine every morning of exercising those muscles until those muscles became so strong, way stronger than you know, my similar muscles or your similar muscles, so strong that now they now compensate for the weakness in his spine. Problem has been solved. It's a very interesting way of how we can use our awareness and to find little ways of dealing with the problems in our life, which, you know, it's, uh, it's very positive, very successful. So that was how he was using the mindfulness to actually to extend those muscles. As for our own personal our ways, but once you develop mindfulness of any place in your body, it becomes quite easy to be able to manipulate those parts of the body. And uh, my story, which again I tell every year, and it's important, if ever any of you ever have to give public talks, please, you know, uh, remember this, 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 this way of presenting, because after a while, you know, people start falling asleep. So I like telling at this point the time when I had um, uh, food poisoning. Now, people give you all sorts of food. You know, as a monk, you're supposed to take what you're given. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, sometimes you get very, very um, uh, uh, stomach aches, sometimes diarrhea, sometimes you vomit. But this was one of the worst of all. This was real food poisoning. And when you get the cramps, and I know this because I was in my cave, and then every now and again, ah, oh, ah. This is what I say whenever you give a public talk: do something dramatic in the middle of it, <laughs> otherwise people will fall asleep. Ah, <laughs> and it was you no know, real painful. It's automatic. You can't stop it and just. I'm a monk. I'm not. Ah, you just you scream because it cramps up so much. So there you were having these terrible cramps, 
of food poisoning. So what did I do? I'm too lazy to call the doctor. I'm sorry, but you're busy enough anyway. You don't need anybody else to, to give you more work to do. And it's such a long way from a forest monastery to the hospital. It'll take about half an hour to get there anyway. You'll probably be dead, so you've got your own ways of dealing with things. So what I do is beware, mindful of the incredible pain. Don't try and control it. Don't try and get rid of it. Be with it. That's what mindfulness is. The ability just not to run away, but to even to run towards something and be with it and learn from it, understand it. Because all these things give you an incredible amount of wisdom. Also, that we learn how it, how it works. Because when you're actually feeling that pain, every time you get afraid of it, it tenses up, it gets worse, it's more painful. Every time you learn how to let it be, it actually relaxes a bit. And that was always <laughs> reminding me of the wonderful things which people like nurses would do in the days when they had time to be able just to hold somebody's hand when they were sick and just to be with them. And the great thing with like things like pet therapy, when you take like a dog or a cat you know, to a, a ward where people are in quite, quite a lot of pain, just to spend time with them and they pat the dog and they get a lot of relief. And even in mental health, uh, there is I, I know that uh, studies done of getting people who are, you know, got huge issues in their life to actually just to raise a little puppy, you know, from almost birth. And they just, it's incredible the amount of change which they have to just their attitude towards life and to themselves. And much of their bad behavior is alleviated just because you're learning some kindness. And so, you find, if you give kindness towards so a pain, you find it relaxes, it's letting go, it's opening the door of your heart to something, and it's wonderful actually to see that occur in your own mindfulness. Instead of being afraid, trying to control, trying to get rid of, you are kind, you open up to it, allow it to be with this beautiful warmth. And if you experiment like that with yourself, you're mindful and you're giving it some kindness and you feel it relax and relax and relax and relax and relax. And it's an amazing thing to be able to do. One of the reasons that you know I don't mind teaching, 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 teaching. Because when you start teaching these things you get really, really amazing, wonderful results. I'm not just saying that, because I don't get anything out of this except more work, more books to sign. <laughs> I don't get any money out of this. It's all given to some other organization. But you do it because you get a lot of happiness back, a lot of fulfillment. My salary is just so bad, but my job satisfaction is really way out of this world. <laughs> That's a pun, out of this world, okay, never mind. <laughs> so, to be able to actually to do that, to relax your own body, it took about 20 minutes from full-on food poisoning to nothing at all, just perfect health of my guts. And of course I do that to many other things. You when you have a cough or a cold, or you get sort of, uh, like one mentioning about Korea. Because you know, the w you had the Winter Olympics? About two years ago, I was in South Korea, the same area. And they invited me to come up to the Winter Olympics. And I thought, I better not, because they might have asked me to go um, doing the, what's it called, the, the ski jump? <laughs> I've never been on a pair of skis, but you just to stand on there. And as soon as you get to the end of the jump, you just levitate the rest of the way. <laughs> so, would that be cheating? to levitate and then you go all the way. So you know. <laughs> but anyway, no, no. So, uh, but when I was in Korea that time, it's, it's really cold. I think it was minus 16 degrees outside when I was there. And so you went out there and I had a cold. Obviously you get a cold because it's so, so chilly out there. And it was only about 20 minutes and I had to face the cameras for an interview on live TV. Now, have you ever seen anyone on live TV 
sort of sneezing and having snot all over the, the interviewer. That's really gross. You can't do that. So what you do is because you know, it's all organized and we can't let people down. So I don't like taking any sort of you know, antihistamines or anything like that. So instead, you're just mindful, aware of the feelings in your nose. It's called nose awareness. He who knows, knows a nose. So, <laughs> so you're feeling it. And once you really get the full feeling of that irritation in your sinuses or whatever, then you can feel how to relax it, how to let it be, to ease it off until the nose felt so normal that nothing was coming out anymore. You felt totally 100% normal. So you go and give the give the interview, no problem at all. Now this is nothing, this is not a psychic power, this is something which anyone can do, because I've taught this and people do do it, that they can actually heal some amazing stuff you know, with this mindfulness and adding the kindness to it. That's why I love teaching it. Every now and again, somebody sa gives me this incredible feedback. The one which I always remember, it stays in mind, probably stay in my mind till I die, was a lady who, from Eastern Europe, had chronic arthritis. And she was, uh, hopefully that you never get chronic arthritis, but in such incredible pain that she had to have these very strong painkillers, as she said, just to get through the day, to survive. There's no apparent cure for it. Deformed, incredible pain. And after a while, surely there must be something else. So she got onto the YouTube channel. She sort of learned this meditation, mindfulness and the kindness. And she wrote me this wonderful email back. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't need to take those painkillers anymore. Because the arthritis is gone. Amazing to be able to mindfulness and kindness to relaxing because as the doctors here tell me I don't know too much about medicine. I just know about the pain and the feelings and the stuff But there's an information now, Can you reverse that information? Maybe you can The most important thing about the mind and the body is that they do interact and it was one of these experiments which really proved it to me many years ago when I was still a student at Cambridge. And it was an experiment which has been replicated, but not that often because it's a bit sort of gross, that uh, they put this person under hypnosis and they took uh, a piece of wood with a four-inch nail on the end and they convinced this uh, person under hypnosis that the, the nail was red hot. It wasn't red hot, it was just normal temperature. You know, a baby could touch it and it wouldn't hurt. But this man under hypnosis was convinced it was red hot. And they touched it on the skin. And because he thought it was red hot, he screamed in pain. I could accept that. But then what I never expected to see was a blister come up. The, the skin was wounded, it, it burnt. And that was one of the first times, it's an experiment which you can look up on the internet, it's been done several times, just if uh, the mind can actually create a wound on the body, a burn, when can't we use that mind to actually overcome these sicknesses and wounds? And of course that was the obvious thing for me, and you see it can be done. It takes a little bit of a while, a bit of training, but I think that's an area of medicine which is now being explored. It's not just taking away the pain, it's taking away also the things which are causing those pains. And I think in these days when there is a huge amount of uh, public resources going to healthcare, I think many sort of health professionals will want to use as much as they can from wherever to actually to try and make sure that people live in reasonably good health, both mental and uh, physical, without getting too many of these sicknesses, or at least being able to, to deal with them in an appropriate way. So, 
I mention that because it makes people interested. It's called marketing. <laughs> if it's learning as to how to be happy, yeah, well, we've heard that before. But when it's healthy, the physical happiness, that you've all been through stuff before, you've also probably seen people who have been suffering badly from cancers, from mental disease like schizophrenia, attention to deficit disorder, all this other stuff, depressions which come in our modern age. Can't we have other ways of dealing with this? And there are these ways. And it's up for you to see if they work. So, now, I just, I will do one or two questions and then I will lead you in a little mindfulness uh, with the body exercise. But first of all, any questions or comments just from the floor here? Anyone would like to ask about this uh, mindfulness and happiness and health? There's no extra charge for questions. <laughs> and if you think, oh, a question is stupid, there's no such thing as a stupid question. I know that sometimes people feel that, oh, if I ask a question, people will think I'm stupid. But, if you don't ask a question, then you'll be stupid. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, thank you. It's, it's getting that way, that more and more people are being trained in mindfulness. But, like, in today's world is really, really busy. Is it? Am I busy? Have a look at page one of, or page two, of Happiness Every Day. And you see there is a quote, a definition of what a busy person is. A busy person is not someone who has a lot of things to do. A busy person is someone who does too many things at the same time. Have you ever seen that? Like high achievers, they do so much work, but it's as if they're doing no work at all. It just flows. Doing one thing at a time. Being here, doing it, rather than worrying about all this other stuff you have to do in life. Oh, if I worry about all the things which I have to do in life, oh, I'll go crazy. All the next appointments, all the next things in my schedule. Actually, the, I think my organizers say, they know I don't look at my schedule. That's why I keep going over time. <laughs> I just let somebody else worry about that. I just sit here and enjoy myself. One thing at a time. So, that brings me on to the next little bit of meditation. And then we're going to do another, m oh, mm, well, yeah. oh, we can do a little bit of meditation again, because it's supposed to be a bit of mindfulness, and then we can have a break. Yeah, that will work. This is, we'll have the break first. No. Okay, if, if you need to have a break, please go. The letting go rooms, it's another form of meditation. We go there, oh, it's having a glass of water. Meditation. Oh, it's having a tissue meditation. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, so, this is the type of meditation, oh, yeah, don't do it yet, I haven't <laughs> described it yet, and people are just so in the future. So, <laughs> so here, that um, how can we practice this type of meditation? Because some people say, oh, it's okay for you, Ajahn Brahm, you live in a monastery, you don't have much work to do. <laughs> you don't have much responsibility. <laughs> you don't have many worries. Okay, fair enough. But, one thing which I do know is just how to deal with whatever life presents to you. It's the attitude to life, not what you have to do in life. So, this is the type of meditation which is a brilliant meditation, because sometimes people oh, I'm tired, I'm sick, I'm really in pain, I can't meditate. And of course you can. Meditation is not what you are observing. 
It can be pain, it can be sleepiness, it can be the dying process, it can be being with a, a really tough boss. It's not what is in front of you which is important. It's how you relate to it. That is the essence of meditation. It's the relationship you have to the things which are thrown up in life, which you're presented to. It's how you deal with it, not what they are. So that was the, the great emperor's three questions, meditation. And many of you should know by now the emperor's three questions. It's not from Buddhist texts, it's not Christian texts, it's from Leo Tolstoy, who wrote a series of short, no, it was actually, he wrote one story in a book of short stories uh, written in, this is uh, Tsarist Russia, uh, to support the Jewish community who were uh, being quite discriminated against in Tsarist Russia, you know, when Tolstoy, Chekhov were quite well-known authors. And this is where I first read it when I was at university. And it was a beautiful story, The Emperor's Three Questions. It was an emperor, it's very sort of uh, uh, good for our modern world, who had it up to here with religions. Always who's right, who's wrong, promising things and just being a bit immoral or corrupt in the background. And he had it up to here with religions, not Christian, whatever. It is Buddhist, but you don't talk <laughs> about it. <laughs> but that's one of the problems that people are scared about uh, defending their religious territories. So you, you, even like things like yoga. I mean, there was I know there was one even church group in in Australia. They sort of banned teaching yoga in their churches, and they say because that's that's not Christian. And I was just, why do you do that? It's stopping people just healing and helping themselves, you know, because it's not maybe mentioned in your particular holy book. That is a big problem. So we call it mindfulness, so we can get the benefits of this practice without uh, any of the religious uh, ownership problems which actually stop other people making the best benefit out of it. Out of it. That's the only reason. So, it's also with you know, some meditations, it uh, costs a lot of money. So, here, I undercut the market. <laughs> but just because this is free, doesn't mean it's worthless. That's one of the problems. This lady called and said, I hear you teach meditation. Yes. So, then, how much do you charge? I said, nothing. She replied, well, you can't be any good then. <laughs> How about the phone? That happened. <laughs> you can understand why, because in our world we always think, have the opinion that if it costs a lot, it must be worth much more. And the more you charge, the better it must be. So these days, of course, you know, you have the old trick. We don't say it's free. We say it's priceless. So thank you. Yes, go on. Have you found any overlap um, with your background in physics into what mm. you're doing now? Huge. Huge overlap. This is a whole different area, but uh, this is theoretical physics. This was the, the hard physics. Even uh, for me, I I intended to do this at Cambridge, start off in pure maths and then go off to uh, applied maths theoretical physics. And as far as logic is concerned and reason, you know, even the pure mathematicians, they were supposed to be you know, the top. And they even accused me of selling out by being an applied mathematician and theoretical physicist. You know, to making too many inferences. But you know, in there also you get people like uh, Stephen Hawkins and Roger Penrose. So these are really, really uh, strong uh, people who actually move the boundaries of the world to actually do things. So I was always interested in being more of a theoretical physicist rather than a pure mathematician. But it was very close between the two of those. So even uh, there you would be totally rational. And that's why one of my friends, one of my best friends, uh, 
f he was actually the first Buddhist I ever met. Many of you have heard this story. Uh, I became a Buddhist because I read books. And I thought, well that fitted me. I wasn't rejecting any other religion. It was just that this was the one which fat me best, what I wanted to do. And so I didn't know any other place to go, but when I went to Cambridge there was this, um, all these clubs and societies you could join. And when I saw and I went into the corn exchange in Cambridge where they had all, it's like an exhibition of, of clubs and societies to look after a student's social life. And I saw the Buddhist Society of Cambridge University. And oh, my eyes went wide, I was so excited that you know, there were other Buddhists in this world and I could have a, a university where I could actually follow that path. And so I went to the, the bench there, the, um, the table, and I said, I want to join. And the fellow said, you don't have to join. Just come and see, just listen to a few talks. So no, I really want to join, I'm a Buddhist. You don't have to be. Just come, we accept anybody. And that's when I got quite angry. I got <laughs> it cost about a pound for the year. I got a pound out, slammed on, join me up now. <laughs> and that fellow became, you know, one of my best friends, Professor Bernard Carr, Emeritus Professor of Theoretical Physics at Queen Mary College and a cl such a close disciple of Stephen Hawkins that uh, uh, I did watch the movie of uh, The Theory of Everything because you know, he was featured in that movie, uh, Bernard. So it's really sort of that close to, and, uh, to um, Stephen Hawkins. And he's also, when I, we were young at Cambridge, we also joined, as well as the Astronomical Society, the, the Psychic Research Society. We used to go ghost hunting together. <laughs> because that whole part of life, what's going on there? Is it real? Is it a fake? And this is actually where the nature of the mind, that experiment which I said about the touching, the that, that was um, the Psychic Research Society, he's also the treasurer of the Psychic Research Society in London. He said, tries to keep that quiet because that might affect his professional reputation. But the mind and the science, that is just an avenue which is opening up more and more and more. Huge amount to be known there. And this is not crazy science. This is the hardest science you could possibly get. And people also like Brian Josephson, a, uh, he's the one who's, he's also came, he's, he's a, I think he's the only um, uh, Welshman to have got the Nobel Prize for Physics. Uh, it's um, quantum tunneling, the, the basics of uh, supercomputers operating at such incredibly low temperatures. And he made that discovery after meditating. He did, he was TM. So, and he's still got, he's looked upon as being a bit sort of uh, wacky, but he's got a Nobel Prize, he can't be wacky. So and this is an area here which is incredibly interesting to actually to investigate, take it further. So anyway, I, I can go on for a long lot. I, I, I actually, I'm quite passionate about this because this is something where science is not being scientific. And as a result of that, people are suffering. Uh, just as a quick follow-up, was that then even more a post look on at that time when you joined? That as oh, those when you said, oh, he's wacky, is that oh, they are doing this, that, those are the weirdos? Were you saying that it's becoming more and more? It's more and more, more and more accepted, but there is still sort of resistance. Okay, here we go. The, um, there's even 1981, there was a guy called Professor John Lorber, Sheffield University, and uh, his, uh, his field of study was whether the shape of the human skull affected people's health and emotional health and mental health. So, you see people's skull shapes are different. And he found one person on university whose skull shape was deformed. He could notice it, but no one else does, because you know, we don't really know too much about skull shapes. So he invited this young man, who was a graduate student. He's, he'd al already got his first class honours in mathematics at Sheffield University, and invited him on to do this program. 
to see how his skull shape had affected his brain. And that's when, you know, the SHIT hit the fan when they did the CAT scan because he didn't have a brain. It was filled with uh, intracranial fluid. Only I think a one, was it one millimeter or five, two millimeters of cortex, a sheath, nothing else. That scan was done a couple of times just to make sure there was no, no, uh, nothing wrong with the apparatus. Professor John Lorber called him the boy with no brain, who was totally normal. In fact, you know, in the sort of the, the, uh, the um, graph of normality, he was actually a little bit more normal than the, the average. You know, he didn't have any problems, had a stable relationship, obviously you know, a genius in mathematics, but he didn't have a brain. And of course, what happened to that? One of the GPs, which I knew, he said, yeah, he's seen that scan, it was redone, really it's real, but it's been put in the back drawer of a filing cabinet because it's it's too challenging. Too challenging for science. If you want uh, a link to that article, because I just downloaded it for someone a few days ago, so I have to send you that link if you want it. The Boy With No Brain, Professor John Orber. Imagine just how many careers that is challenging. How many billion dollars of research grants that is affecting? I love these little areas because to me that's what science always was, pushing the boundaries. Learning new stuff, giving more opportunities, understanding just the unexplained stuff. That was always the interesting stuff for me. Weird, but look, you know, all sort of great scientists are weird. Are you a scientist, sir? A oh. little <laughs> 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 <They're> weird. Only <laughs> weird. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I, I could just talk about that for hours. Anyway, but anyway, let's get to some um, meditation now. So, first of all, out of kindness, get up and stretch. So when you <laughs> when you're ready, you can uh, sit down. Actually, what time are we supposed to go for lunch? <laughs> Almost. i would be a very quick meditation then. By that time, went very quickly. Five minutes. Okay, five minutes of meditation. Sit down quick. Was <laughs> 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 eleven thirty? I did eleven fifteen. Okay. Okay. Five minutes. <laughs> Sorry, I know the size. I went through a time warp. It's now 11 o'clock. Okay. <laughs> so you sit down. Come aware of your body. Close your eyes. It's nice to close your eyes. How does your body feel? What's it like? Don't be afraid of your body. Just feel it. It's like you're zooming in. You know, like you get on Google Maps, Google Earth, you zoom in to sort of uh, East Asia, zoom in to Hong Kong, zoom in Sassoon Road, zoom in to the center of misbehavioral health, <laughs> zoom in to this room, zoom into this body. It's coming home. You feel it. How does your body feel now? Get to know your own body. Get to know its truth, how it feels. Not how it should feel, or how other people tell you it should be, but how it actually is right now. Get to know this body and give it permission to be as it is. 
Now, I know when people meditate or mindfulness, sometimes they think about posture. You ask your body, body, are you comfortable? And listen to the answer from your body, being sensitive to its needs. Mindfulness, how do we get mindfulness? One of the skillful means is to ask the question. Ask your body how you feel, and then you become mindful of your body. Ask your, your legs how they feel, and then you become mindful of them. Your butt, how does your butt feel? How do your butt, your, how's your back feeling right now? Once you get awareness, you've zoomed into one part of your body, then you can manipulate it. If it's painful or tight, causing you a problem, then how can you relax that problem? Kindness, letting it be opening the door of your heart to this moment. If it relaxes, carry on. If it gets tense, then you're going in the wrong direction. But at least you're learning. The fear, control, trying to be different than you are, wanting to feeling you don't fit in. You go into this moment and be with it. Respect. Respect the truth of your body right now. And hopefully you'll discover that when you truly relax and let things be, things get easy and peaceful. They heal. Know your own body, heal your body. And your body starts to feel so relaxed and peaceful. If your body does get to be peaceful, relaxed, as my body feels now, I don't want to leave. I want to stay here. There's no effort. It's a delight to be relaxed. And to feel just all the, the winds, the chi of the body just go where it needs to go. A guitar string, when it's pulled at both ends, it becomes stressed. And if something hits it, it makes a very loud sound. If you loosen both ends of that string, no sound at all. The impingements of life, disappointments, successes, your football team winning, getting sacked from work, things hit that string but it makes no sound because you're relaxed. You have resilience when you're not pulled back into the past. You're not stretched by fear of the future. The guitar string, your body, your mind, not being pulled or stretched, just here, at peace, resilient.
Okay. So now you can open your eyes. No, I didn't want to either. <laughs> so now it's time for your lunch. You're back again at two. Thank you, Ajahn Brown. Let's give, let's do a sadhu to Ajahn Brown. What does sadhu mean? Sadhu is a party word, and its best translation into English is awesome. <laughs> so let's do the Ajahn Brown way of sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> Thank how you. How do you say that in Cantonese? Sadhu. Oh, sin, sin joy. Sin joy. Okay, sin joy three times. <laughs> sin joy. Sin joy. Sin joy. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, what time are we coming back? So, we will come back at 2 and please enjoy your Noble Silence lunch. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs>